Hey everybody, my name is Kai Savaz. Welcome to a brand new film music media conversation. I'm uh, here with the amazing Kevin Smithers, Roy Ambries, and Arturo Ambries, the, the brothers, co-directors, co and the composer of Frankelda's Book of Spooks, also known as Sustos Ocultos de Frankeldo, uh, Frankelda. And uh, thank you guys so much for joining me. This is so great to sit down and talk and have the directors with our with the amazing composer and talk about animation. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah. So I Makes guess this... To start off, um, I, uh, you know, you first of all, congratulations on the series. It's 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 beautiful. It's and to see stop motion kind of thriving. You know, I I just came back from a screening of Chicken Run two, and Sam Fell came with all the models and everything. And to see your show on Cartoon Network Ladam and and you know, really, you know, it's just a beautiful series. So congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much. I know I know all the work that goes into that, all the painstaking work. So. But uh, yeah, so I guess to start off, uh, how do you all know each other? I guess let's uh, introduce ourselves and like, how did you guys meet and how did this kind of collaboration uh, begin? <laughs> Arturo, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, hi, my name is Arturo. It's an honor to be here. Well, I actually met my brother Roy about 33 years ago <laughs> in the <a> hospital <laughs> when he was born, and we've been collaborating ever since. We only professionalized our daily life, the way in which we used to play and create stories. Yeah. And we met Kevin uh, some years ago when we were trying to score a film that we were producing. And like one or two days after meeting him, he sent us a demo of how he would score that feature film. And we were perplexed. And since that moment on, uh, we've been collaborating on basically all our projects, the ones in which we direct and the ones that we produce. And it's been a, a great time uh, collaborating creatively. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Kevin, what were your what were your first impressions when you when you met these brothers? Uh, they came. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> likewise. I mean, it's funny because that that movie that that Arturo's talking about, like we're we're still working on that movie. It's been a kind of a long time coming to get yeah. to fruition, but like, it's so funny that that was the first thing we ever kind of did together, and then we did a bunch of stuff in the middle, and then we're kind of coming back to that really cool idea, but it's kind of morphed into like a even better version of that idea because now there's like you know songs and we'll talk about how we like do a lot of songs together and stuff but like that idea has kind of evolved into like a different the same beast but like improved i think um and yeah no i mean working with them is so like fun and easy which you know it's it's not something that happens all the time because of like yeah. you know time constraints and it's stressful and whatnot but like these guys are very good at making the collaboration kind of super fun and easy and kind of allowing me to like run with my ideas, which is super fun. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I want to, I want to talk about, I talk about Frank Elda. So, but before we jump into that, I'm just curious, uh, you know, since uh, we are focusing on your guys' collaboration on the series and it's such a beautifully done stop motion uh, animation series and, and Kevin, you have a history in animation and, and, and you guys all, I mean, we're all here. We all love animation. So I want to go around and, and just ask ask that question. Why do you love animation? Why is animation what what does animation speak to you as storytellers? I'm curious. So Roy, I wonder if you want to kick us off. What does animation mean to you as a storyteller? Well, for me, animation is the opportunity uh, to rearrange the reality, which sometimes is really boring or really awful. <laughs> so <laughs> as creators, um, my brother and I, and I include here Kevin, I think that we try to make this world to be a better place and we cannot go um, and make people to be friends or to stop wars, but yeah. we can help them to feel different and to see the world with different point of views. And we can do it uh, with our art. And I think that the most powerful and for me, the most wholesome uh, form of art is animation stop motion because it includes all the arts. And for my brother and I, it's easy uh, 
to think visually and to think in characters and to think in the creating the worlds. But what we cannot do is to think how the music uh, is going to be uh, like helping us to create all of this. And music is really important because music evoked to the emotions. So finding Kevin and working with him has, uh, has been really awesome because he understands what we are doing, what we are trying to do. Yeah. And he feels that gap that we don't have. So for us, it's amazing to collaborate with him. That's amazing, yeah. So Arturo, for you, what, is, what does animation mean to you? Why, why does it speak to you as a storyteller, as a filmmaker? For me, animation is the possibility to do anything that you imagine. There's nothing that animation cannot do. Yeah. If you want to have dinosaurs singing or planets exploding or protons and neutrons um, flying through the skies, everything is possible because the thing that animation does better than any other medium for me is to give a shape to imagination. Yeah, absolutely. And Kevin, for you as, as, a, as a musical storyteller, I mean, you, you've, you've worked in animation before and, and you've thrived in this space. And so I'm curious, what, what, keeps you, what keeps you coming back to it? Why do you love it so much? I mean, I think my answer is very close to what Roy already said. I mean, I, I, I started falling in animation when I was like younger and like looking at like the Disney Renaissance kind of animated movies. I was such a fan. Yeah. And to me, like when you have like, especially those kind of musicals, it's so beautiful that in like, just like a, a span of like two and a half minutes, you'll have all the arts coming together. And like, just in this super condensed moment, there'll be like acting and writing and lyrics and singing and music and everything just condensed into that little space. And I thought that was so cool that you can combine all of those things into like this super condensed. And that's just like a musical number. But then, you know, when you start talking about like stop motion in particular, you start adding like sculpting and like, yeah. it's really all the possible like art forms coming together to, to do something bigger than the parts. And that to me is amazing. You know, yeah. that's why I'm, I'm in love with the, with the medium. Absolutely. So I want to jump into to uh, Frank Aldo. So I guess before we we kind of talk about your guys' approach and how you got how you and Kevin all you work together on the music and the score. So uh, Arturo and Roy, I want you to talk to me about I guess what's the inspiration of the series? What made you want to make this series? And for people who maybe have never seen the series, uh, what what's it about? Uh, well, for us, uh, Frank Elda is the opportunity to I think that there are different answers to this question. I think that the approach that I'm going to use is that it's a way in which we can uh, focus uh, some frustration that we have because as artists in Mexico, it's really difficult to live on doing arts. I think mm -hmm. that anywhere in the, in the world, but in Mexico, there's not an industry uh, of animation or or anything like that. So um, the idea to have something to say and to want to do something, but have a lot of obstacles and people uh, saying, no, you cannot do this. No, you cannot write. No, you cannot do your own animation. Inspired us to create this Mexican uh, woman writer, which every uh, all her life, everybody told her that she cannot right so he comes back as a ghost in order to tell uh, her stories yeah because he uh, she cannot do any she couldn't do anything else and i think that's that's the why we created this character of frankelda yeah uh, so arturo what, what for you why, why did you want to make this story what spoke what made you want to put it to bring it to life I think that nowadays kids aren't getting their scary films as we used to. Yeah. Uh, there's a fear that children might not understand when their the ending isn't good or when the characters are a little bit spooky. 
and we think that being a little bit afraid of some characters and some series in our youth was a very good thing for us yeah uh, it always left us thinking and those are the characters and story that we remember the most when you are treated as a child and and everyone is giving you magical pink and fluffy explanations about life you start doubting and you feel like someone is making fun of you or, or that they are not taking you seriously so this yeah. is our way to to take children seriously and to give them something that they can ponder about absolutely i agree with that completely and uh uh kevin for you what uh i know you you already had a collaboration going but for you when they when they presented you with the pitch and for this for this idea i'm curious what was your initial reaction what drew you to it what did you love about that story well i mean the the project funny enough evolved from the moment they pitched me the idea to what ended up happening with the music because the show was wasn't really meant to be a musical at the beginning mm. they they had one song in one episode that they knew they wanted like a musical number for this specific uh episode because he was kind of it was a coco and he was like this monster that kind of like sings and dances and has all these musical instruments and steals kids passion for music so there was there was a, a like a plot reason to have a song in that episode and but these guys are fans of musicals and so am I. And and after we did that first song, because we had to do it beforehand so that they could have time to animate to. Yeah. Um, they loved it so much. And they were like, you know what? We love musicals. Let's do it. You know, so they just kind of rewrote the, the show pretty much overnight to make it into a musical so that each episode would have a musical number. And, you know, it was kind of daunting because, you know, I grew up having, you know, being a fan of like Alan Menken and Howard Ashman, like all these people were my idols. So like being kind of allowed or entrusted to do both the songs and the score was really scary because yeah. I knew I couldn't hide. <laughs> yeah, you're, you know, I had to bring, you're front and center, man. <laughs> yeah, I had to bring my A game and make sure that they were happy with everything. And, you know, that's kind of how it ended up happening. And I'm, I'm really proud of what we did. So, yeah, that's yeah, a... that was kind of the journey. Absolutely. So, so yeah, take, take me behind, I guess the process. So, uh, so each, so each episode has a musical number. So of course you would need, uh, you know, a song from Kevin first, and then in order to animate two. So, uh, how, how, take me through production. Is it, you, is it songwriting then, uh, you know, principal production and then post, and then you start working on the score later, or do you kind of work on the score and the song at the same time up ahead and, I'm curious what the, I guess the, what's the starting point, what's the end point to an episode, if you want to take us through, like from start to finish. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, usually, I mean, because this was going for, for Cartoon Network and HBO Max, we kind of did all the episodes in one go yeah. instead of like a weekly network sort of like format. Um, so they had like the the scripts and I believe you guys sent me the, the, the teleplays, the scripts for the, each episode. And then um, we essentially collaborate on the lyrics. Arturo and Roy sent me like very beautifully written kind of like prose of like what the what the song uh, uh, needed to be about and what they wanted the to the characters sing about and whatnot. And then I took that and I wrote the the actual song. And then we went back and forth a couple of times. Once we had that ready, then I kind of like led them through their own devices for a few months. And then they came back once they had like actual like finished animation um, for me to do the score. Yeah. So, so guys, when you have the song, uh, so once you have the song recorded, is it, uh, is it, or is it fully recorded by the time you're animating or is it still kind of just like a, a demo or a, or kind of scratch or is it a fully produced song ready to go? And then you guys can work on the animation. We usually have like this version that is very locked in, in rhythm, in timing, but usually what Kevin does is that he adds like digital instruments. Mm -hmm. So it's not like the final instruments or the final mixing that happens after the production is ready. Uh, because we had an amazing opportunity to record with a string orchestra. So oh, wow. all instruments were replaced. And then we had a final mix. 
So it's very good to do this process. Uh, it's not very uh, straightforward. It's like on different phases. Yeah. Wow. That's a... so. So Kevin, are you? So you got to record with an actual with actual musicians. It wasn't all in the box. No, we were lucky enough to to stretch the budget a little bit so that we can record yeah. uh, some orchestra. And the the great thing about Von and Roy is that they were they're so artistic and they love music so much that when I pitched them the idea of like, Hey, when we figure out if we can potentially record some musicians, they were like so excited about it. And they were super, they were as excited as I was to, to try and, <laughs> you know, see if we could like make it happen. And we did. So, um, yeah, we recorded an orchestra for the main titles and the songs and the credits. Uh, and then we kind of like got some phenomenal soloists, to come in and, and perform little parts for the certain parts of the score for the episodes. That's awesome. So I'm curious yeah. about, I guess, uh, talk to me about, I guess, the working relationship between all three of you. Because uh, first of all, Kevin, I'm, I can't, I'm, like, uh, do you see them as a unit? Do you see them as, as like, two, you know, the two heads on, on, one, on one pair of shoulders? Or do you know who to go to for certain feedback? I'm curious, like, how the dynamic is between all three of you. Because I've, I've heard, like, I've talked to Carter Burwell, and he'll talk about working with the Cohen brothers and how, he knows kind of, oh, this one, I know where to go for certain <laughs> things. I'm curious, for, as a composer, when you need to get something from your directors, uh, are, are they a unit together or, do you, or, or are each of you kind of uh, tackling different parts of the production? <laughs> it's so funny. I definitely see them as a unit, but like, yeah. I think the biggest thing, Arturo, since we started working together, he now has a daughter. So <laughs> since he's had a daughter, I think he's just like way more tired now. So I feel like Roy, Roy steps in and like gives most of the feedback because Arturo just wants to fall asleep. <laughs> That's true. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So Roy, you take over for uh, when uh, so Arturo can catch up on on sleep from his dad duties. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, but I'm curious about for, for you two as brothers, like, how do you collaborate? You know, I'm, you know, I, I have, I have a younger brother and, uh, you know, we can get into arguments as well. And then, but at the end of the day, it's all love and everything. So I'm curious, uh, when you disagree, uh, how do you guys come to, I guess, to make sure that the vision is realized for the story and make sure that you're giving Kevin, you know, not like, oh, don't listen to him, you know, or something like that. So I'm curious, <laughs> how do you work together as, as brothers? <laughs> Yeah, it has been uh, sometimes difficult, but as you say, I think that when you have a brother and you fight, you always, since we were children, you always kind of know that at the end of the day, the problem is going to be over somehow. Yeah. So, so <laughs> we worked that out. Um, we, we try to work a lot together. We direct and, and write together. Uh, usually Arturo starts writing the, li the lyrics of the songs first, and then I just step in like uh, uh, giving some ideas before pitching that to, to Kevin. Um, and what we do in our daily work in, our, in the productions is that I kind of direct more all the visual uh, construction, the puppets, the sets, and Arturo goes more into the animation and the main photography and i think that our collaboration with kevin works because none of us knows anything about creating music so we trust him 100 percent on that so we always when we talk with kevin we had a previous meeting and we tell our ideas uh, and in in that moment in which we know what to communicate to Kevin is when we trust him and usually it's 99.9 percent .9 what we imagined we just sometimes have to say what if we do like a little bit more grand finale over here or mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if it has to be a little bit more spooky but usually we trust him uh, almost uh, he, he's a genius yeah <laughs> that's very sweet um, I know. I, I, I am going to say that one, one thing that I've, you know, I, I've worked with a few directors, a few showrunners, a, a, a lot of them really talented. But one, one of the things that I really love about one on Roy, especially with music, uh, is that they, they really like, they build, they build an area and then saying like, okay, this is the world that we're in. This is kind of what we're looking for. But then once we're in that area, 
they really just give me creative freedom to be like, give us your best version of what you think this should be. Yeah. And they really, they really trust me and give me that kind of creative freedom. And I think them kind of taking that leap and allowing me to just like kind of go like, well, I think we should do this and then start building on my own kind of fantasies really allows us to like, I think get the best work out of me because yeah. I never feel like they're always guiding me. They're always directing me, but I never feel like I'm constrained by something incredibly specific or particular. You know, they know what yeah. they want and where they where the music what the music needs to feel like but they're never getting so so granular that it holds the creative process so they're not yeah so they're not dictating you know they're they're you're allowing you to still be your have your voice as a composer and make the whole vision a unified vision like as a team you're telling the story all together yeah very much so and they're they're so so kind of collaborative beings maybe this comes from them being brothers i don't know why but like it's so fun as a composer and a songwriter to like, when we're writing the songs, I even go like, oh, wouldn't it be fun if like the character does this thing or this thing when they're saying this line? And they're usually very like, oh, that's a good idea. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, let's try that, you know? And it's it's fun to have an impact as a composer and songwriter like that, which we usually yeah. work on at the end, you know? <laughs> so, exactly, yeah, you're the, you're the fixer, but now you, you're you actually part of the, you're in the conversation. I mean, I think for this process, for stop motion, it has to be, especially with the songs, like you get to be, and uh, I, I love the idea of kind of, music kind of helping shape the narrative because myself I'm not a I'm not a musician I'm not a composer I went to film school as well uh in Baltimore and moved out to LA to pursue filmmaking and everything and ended up in animation somehow I can't draw I can't draw for shit but like you know I work <laughs> in production systems and it's been so rewarding getting to work with all these amazing creators like Gendy Tartakovsky and Adam Muto and and all these amazing guys and um and uh, you know and getting to just see that creativity so but i'm curious for uh for arturo and roy uh for for uh frank Helda, is this a, a studio a stop motion animation studio that you uh, founded or you're working with a unique studio that's producing uh the show for you no uh we actually founded this studio 12 oh, years wow. ago wow we started with uh, artistic short films some commercial work specifically for Cartoon Network for their um, commercial breaks, like yeah, adapting yeah. characters for short stop motion uh, pieces. Uh, we did a lot of music videos. Uh, so we have that experience working on with music and stop motion. Um, after a lot of work, uh, Cartoon Network Latin America gave us the opportunity to pitch them a horror show and this is what we came with uh, this is what we came up with we created a pilot episode for them and originally they were a little hesitant because it wasn't to the animation yeah. it wasn't uh, based on comedy and it wasn't for small children so we didn't get like a check mark on the three most important uh, like signatures of the Cartoon Network brand. But luckily for us, uh, that's when they announced that HBO Max was coming. So when that happened, they needed shows that were different looking yeah. for a target a little bit broader than kids. And they also needed something uh, that looked... Um, that was overall different. So that's when they decided to approve the pilot episode and order the whole season. That's amazing. I mean, that's such a, uh, it's, I mean, 12 years is such a long time to that journey, but I mean, congrats. I mean, I just have to say congratulations because I know how it feels to finally see kind of the fruits of your labor kind of come to life. And after all that work and all that, you know, you know, that passion and love and putting into it and, and, uh, and Kevin's score kind of bring it to life. I mean, it's just, it's fantastic. And, and it's, it's funny how, because we were in that same situation at Cartoon Network Studios because, um, yeah, when they, after the AT&T merger and everyone was like, boom, we need everything. It was the content. It was the content king. Everybody was making stuff. And those were like a good two years where everybody was just like getting stuff and then whomp, and then everything gets, you know, cut. And we lost a lot of shows off of Max and, and everything. And, and, and yeah, we're going through, we're going through, it's funny. We were for animation. We kept working during COVID. We were working during the strikes. We kept, oh. you know, going, but I feel like we get punished as an industry, you know, it's the most, you know, in terms of 
allowing you know voices I'm, I, it's just so happy to me that you guys your vision was intact and you were able to kind of do what you wanted to do and create a show that was different did you have to deal with any notes any creative notes like oh this is too dark bring it down Will legal and s p notes or are they coming in and going no let's cut this i'm curious were we kind of allowed to just be a little free because it was on max <laughs> <laughs> no, almost uh, we had no notes. That's one That's thing. That's awesome. Uh, good thing of working with Latin America. There, there are less restrictions. There was only one that before we invented all these books, uh, we called our monsters demons, and they said, "No, you cannot use that word. Is that is so religious?" <laughs> and but that was a good note because we created our own species of monster and yeah. it helped us uh, creatively to push ourselves into new boundaries. And yeah, since then they trust us a lot, and it has been we we have been able to do uh, all the to produce all the ideas that that we had. That's awesome. That's amazing. And uh, well, I'm curious for, uh, so so Kevin, when you approach the uh, talk, to, uh, we talked about kind of the song process. Let's talk about the score a bit. Um, what was it like trying to find the tone for the score of the of the series? I know you you worked a little bit um, on Vic and Val, Victor and Valentino, actually, on one of our Cartoon Network Studios productions with Diego. Um, and that was kind of, uh, again, it was awesome to see somebody, you know, bringing that kind of Mexican heritage into like kind of darker things. And I remember him trying to like, I would talk with him. He's like, yeah, I want to get it darker and darker. And it was, it was a bit different. That was traditional 2D animation. It was for the main network, you know, so, but I think you guys got, were able to get away with a little bit more. So Kevin, for you, what was it like building the score once you're in that phase of, of, of the music and what about that series really kind of was it the visuals? Was it the the editing? I'm curious what spoke to you to kind of find the tone and find kind of the, the rhythm of this of the show. Sure. I mean, it's it's interesting because it, it is an animated show and it's definitely viewable uh, for kids, but it doesn't uh, I, many times it doesn't feel like a kid's show. It very much feels yeah. like a, you can watch it as an adult and have fun. And it's kind of like they have down endings and it's kind of spooky, but it's fun. So the music was um, kind of in this thin line where like it had to be spooky, but it also had to be fun um there's some comedy but you don't want to be too on the nose and then you jump into a musical number <laughs> so there's like you visit kind of a lot of different genres and styles mm -hmm. within it but i think uh one of the things we knew is that we wanted to and very much like the vis visuals like it pays homage to like mexican culture but yeah. it's not to a degree that it feels like it's not ridiculous right it is a sub it's a subtle uh, infusion of Mexican culture, but it uh, deals with themes that are universal. And mm -hmm. when we dubbed it into English, because the whole creative team that was in charge of the of the Spanish version created the English version. Uh, when we dubbed it into English, it never felt out of place because the themes and the settings are so universal, yeah. universal, even though it involves Mexican culture. And we knew that for the music, we wanted to like infuse things here and there from, from Mexico, but we didn't want it to be too on the nose. We wanted to have like a very like kind of a lush orchestral score, like what we love and we grew up listening to in these type of shows. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think just going back and forth, we sort of found the line of how spooky it needed to be and how fun it needed to be. It was Absolutely. just kind of a trial and error sort of situation. Um, and the, the advantage of having the composer being also the songwriter is that by the time I got to score the the episodes, we already had like a bunch of songs and themes established from when I wrote yeah. the songs. So I just like took that and I was like, okay, so there's already like a palette kind of that we I landed on months ago. So it wasn't that hard, you know? Yeah. And uh, so uh, guys, for, for Artur and Roy, when you're in one, two, you know, stop motion animation is poor. It's, I mean, all animation is just so particular and every detail is every every second you're building from nothing. So when, when you're building that, I guess the the pacing of a scene or the rhythm and, you, and you're finally in the editing and you're kind of like fine tuning it, uh, do you have, mu are you using temp music or do you have some stuff that Kevin did from earlier that you're kind of shaping a scene before? I'm, I'm curious if you guys work with temp or anything like that to find that kind of rhythm because it's so structured and you have to build it so specific. You know, I'm curious too. Do you guys use temp? <laughs> uh, You've never shown me temp. The, the thing is that we trust in Kevin so much that we want to give him the space to create around our scenes, 
our dramatic moments, our camera movements. Uh -huh. So we don't do not use temp music at all. Oh wow! Um, by the way, we have spotting sessions with him, and we suggest some ideas, but. I think Kevin does a lot of what he has in mind without much guidance on the scoring uh, session. We get very involved on the songwriting phase, but on the scoring, uh, we always want to see what he proposes. And I think there's, in the because of our filmmaking style, there's a lot of rhythms and a lot of themes and a lot of uh, lay motifs and colors and shapes that uh, feel like a little bit musical so yeah. what i believe is that kevin understands all of these uh, dramatic decisions and he uses them to create his own art that's amazing it's funny because i interviewed um one of my favorite interviews i ever did was i sat down with john powell and dean de uh, for how to train your dragon we did like a whole retrospective of the whole trilogy i love that interview by the way dude it was like i john couldn't powell, believe I... john powell is like my boy i love him yeah. so much <laughs> and that even i still think back at it but it was funny because in that moment like there were i brought up the temp question and john's going oh dean has been so great he he doesn't use temp and and uh, you know he knows how it messes with my head and everything and dean was like well i have a confession to make like we we used a lot of temp and we just never showed you the cut. We just never showed you the temp and did. I got on camera, John going like, wait, what? <laughs> He's like, yeah, we had two, we have two cuts. We have the John Powell cut we sent to you. And then we have the one that we're editing with and we use temp. And he's like, it's all of your old music to shape the scenes. <laughs> so, but it's, it's because I, I think, yeah, because I think, I mean, uh, the temp gets pooped on a lot, like, especially from composers, because I know some directors or producers fall in love with the temp and then you have to just kind of, you know, it doesn't become original anymore. But I do see the, the need to kind of, at least in my mind, because the reason why I got into filmmaking is because of film music. And that's why I started the site. Like I'm not a composer, but I want to teach hopefully other directors and other writers, not just other composers, like the importance of music. And I think for me, listening to scores and using them even in the edit to shape things, because I love to just like, listen to my favorite scores and you can start building scenes in your head it, like the the dna of this drama is already there so i'm curious for you guys if you don't using temp what is kind of influencing the i guess the the emotional current or the emotional arc throughout a scene like how do you build that the the climax and come down and do, do you just have that like you just go on instinct and you and then Kevin, i'm sure you just like and when you have the spying session you're just like okay i know exactly where i need to to come in like do you just you know how to leave that space for for kevin musically yeah, we trust uh, on our instincts, but also we study a lot. We both study the filmmaking. Yeah. So we study not only animated films, but we like to say that we love to watch uh, from Tarkovsky to Tartakovsky. So <laughs> we, we learn about all of the masters. And um, I think that a good thing for Kevin is that we love music. We love musicals. We love the plasticity of music. And I think that there are some parallelisms, as Kevin mentioned, like between sculpting and doing music. But the good thing for Kevin is that we don't understand how it works. We <laughs> only understand how yeah. make it feel. So we trust on our images. We trust on our uh, cinematography language. We try with all the visuals, we are not afraid of sometimes changing all the the color of the lights or if we uh, sometimes we know how to use the camera, if it has to move around or if it has to just stay, if we have to do longer a scene or do a lot of cutting. And I think that we are always thinking of musicals and on music, but mm -hmm. we don't under, understand how it works. So when it arrives at Kevin, it feels that it flows, but he has a, a lot of space to feel that. Yeah. So like Kevin, do you feel you feel that when you get that lock picture that it already has like that rhythm and flow for you, and it just it, it it's already speaking to you as the composer? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I I think they're definitely like the the scenes just have like a pace to to themselves. Any scene, yeah. and you just have to sort of like get into that vibe and once you're in it you're like okay i think i think i know what they're doing so i know what i have to do now 
you know yeah and and the other side of the coin is that i also write so like i i also yeah. like admire these guys and and from a writing perspective i'm like oh that's cool so like <laughs> you know even as a writer i'm like that's that's fun that's cool like i like what they did so like i i kind of find a way to you know into the the scenes as a composer through that as well yeah absolutely well, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, you guys are awesome. I mean, you guys have uh, created this amazing series and it, and it just, it just breathes into life. And I love, I share all the sentiments that you're talking about, about not kind of talking down to an audience and especially in creating something that's a little bit, has a little bit more emotional substance, a little bit you know, tougher things to deal with. You know, I grew up watching Don Bluth, you know, Don Bluth was my, my go-to. And he, I remember his quote was always saying, you know, treat children the same way you would treat adults. Their emotions are valid and real. And, you know, I can watch Land Before Time today and start crying the same way, you know, I did, you know, when I was, you know, younger. So it's like, and yeah, you're right about the kind of coddling and, you know, really, you know, just making sure they feel safe and nice, which is, you know, it, it can be a comforting thing. Animation can be very comforting, but I think as storytellers, I mean, you're trying to to explore different emotions and different things and the way the world is. And that's what I fell in love with. That's why I fell in love with storytelling, I'm just not animation, but in general. So I'm just... So happy that you guys got to to put together uh, something like that. So I guess, yeah, I want to go around and we talked about kind of like stuff that we grew up with. You know, I, so Don Bluth was one of mine, and Land Before Time, I think for me, was a very important animated film in my life. And uh, growing up, what was kind of your animated movie that you really loved, or maybe top two or three? I know it's hard to pick just one. So maybe Roy, you want to kick us off? What was something from your childhood that really st has stuck with you? Well, um, I think that uh, the animated movie that we watched the most was Space Jam. But yeah, Space Jam was awesome. And <laughs> it, it teaches us, it, uh, it, Space Jam taught us that in animation you can do anything. Yeah. But I think that a really important animated film for me is Disney's The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Oh, yes. Because of the drama and, and we love the medieval aesthetic. And speaking of something that really changed my life, not being animated, but was 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 watching at, uh, when I was like eight years old, watching the musical of the Phantom of the Opera from Andrew Lloyd oh, Webber. Yeah. That completely changed my mind because there was drama and there were practical effects. It was magic and it was there were real emotions. Yeah. And that's why I, I preferred going to Phantom of the Opera than going to a show for kids. They were like, hey, yay, yay, yay. <laughs> that, that, that feeling is one that I have been searching for for all these years. That's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. So Arturo, how about you? Do you, do you share the same thing with your brother or do you have different, different ones? <laughs> well, there was something very important in my life uh, and it was The Nightmare Before Christmas VHS. Oh, yeah because we had that movie and watched it a lot. But the reason this film was so important for us is that on the cover of the VHS, it said Tim Burton's mm -hmm. The Nightmare Before Christmas. And originally I couldn't understand why it was Tim Burton's. Yeah. Because I thought, no, the character is supposed to be called Jack Skellington. <laughs> Who is this Tim Burton guy? <laughs> He doesn't appear in the movie. So <laughs> when I found out that he was the producer and the writer, it was like, are you telling me that there are adults whose work is to create things like yeah. this? Yeah. And then it hit me that we could do the same. Stay all our lives playing with toys, making movies, creating <laughs> characters, building worlds. Absolutely. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I, I was reading. It's funny you talk about the Tim Burton's part, but because Henry Henry Selick, who directed the film, he's still he's like he's like to this. There was some reason to be like to this day, to this day, man. Like I, it's like I don't know why they put that on there. I know why they put that on there, but it's like, it's like I created that movie from like, like my hands from scratch. Like yeah. <laughs> so, but it is very. It's based on Tim's drawings and Tim's art style. So yeah, it's very much his world. And of course, Danny Elfman's music and the songs and everything. And like again, it, it touches on your. I mean, songs having songs and building around musical numbers and stuff like that. Yeah. And and that spooky kind of you know. And it is was it's a there's terrifying things that you know you remember from those. 
And I remember Disney didn't even put their, now it says Disney's, you know, Night Before Christmas. Before it was Touchstone Entertainment. They were like, this is too scary. <laughs> they didn't even put it under right. the Disney brand. They had their Touchstone label on it. So I thought that was really funny. But um, but yeah, so Kevin, for you, what was you? Was something that you grew up? Was there anything animated that really spoke to you just from a movie standpoint or music as well? Like something that really kind of jumped out to you? Sure. I mean, I mean, animation, I think for sure, like the, all of the Disney Renaissance from like, you know, uh aladdin the hunchback to yeah. like like hunts when they did for the lion king and all that stuff um music wise i like the the thing that really the score that that, that made me kind of go like oh i want to do that uh wasn't animation funny enough it was uh Elmer bernstein's score for uh to kill a mockingbird that was i remember watching that and and i was with my flatmate at the time and i was like oh fuck like that's amazing like yeah. i want to do that you know i remember that was the, the point where like i had the light bulb Kind of, kind of moment i don't think anyone has said that that was like their their i always ask somebody asked like what was the kind of score that got you like to kill mockingbird that's amazing like i just bought the 4k i haven't watched it yet but i want to see the like they just remastered it with you know hdr and everything so i want to take a look at it but <laughs> it's just a phenomenal movie with a phenomenal score that yeah you know it's it's impeccably written but also just like so emotional you know? Yeah, and the it's a, it's a weird because you watch it today and it holds up completely like the pacing, the yeah. Gregory Peck's performance, like the 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 that kids' performance. Know. I mean Robert Duvall. I mean it's just like I don't. It's just such. It's just a. It's a movie. It's like a movie. You know. It's like yeah. this is like yeah. It's crafted. It's so well crafted. Um, yeah. But um. So yeah. So I guess to to wrap up our conversation, you know, I did mention kind of uh earlier that you know we talked about a lot of the trials and tribulations that our industry is going through not just animation but as a whole you know we're, we're still in the middle of these strikes that are hopefully coming to an end soon so hopefully by the time you guys are watching this or listening to this that everything has been solved and everyone got their fair deal and it's very important what's happening but i'm curious as you know we're all kind of this, i would say kind of the same age we're kind of coming up into our careers just as things feel like they're kind of falling apart so i'm curious <laughs> You know, from your perspective, like what are some of the good things that are happening? I kind of try to focus on the opt. I'm trying to be optimistic about the future of storytelling and 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 especially animation. So going around, what are some good things that are really happening still that that hopefully will you know grow and keep going? So um, you know, Arturo, if you want to kick us off, is there what do you see as a filmmaker working in the industry today? What are some good things that are that are happening? Well, uh, I'm glad that we are able to produce a lot of things being at Mexico City. 12 years ago, this seemed absolutely impossible. And I think that right now there's a more global perspective of bringing other mixtures into the recipe. So I'm very glad for this opportunity and to know that being in Mexico City has not been an obstacle but maybe the opposite maybe it is like uh, it was our springboard in order to try to jump higher yeah absolutely Roy, right, for you what do, what do you see some some good things that are that are happening yeah i think that the studios big studios have to realize that um general in the public are kind of upset or bored and they are of watching the same stuff yeah and it's not uh it's not like a mis uh, uh i don't know like a secret or something strange yeah. to see why uh, into the spider verse is a hit and uh, yes. it's original and it's experimental and sometimes it's easy for us to see that but so i think that some producers still cannot understand that yeah. people watch new things to watch new voices to hear new voices new point of views and but i think that they slowly are understanding that and because of that and on many other factors i think that a new era of the of authority in the author is coming yes. i think that everybody's searching for authors and strong voices right now yeah, I think there is a, I always say it to talk to my friends, I say we need a new Nouvelle, you know, Nouvelle, Nouvelle Vogue, we need a new wave, a new, new wave, you know, we need, so we, we, it, is, it, is, it is interesting how the industry kind of ebbs and flows, because you go back to that golden age, and it's like, yeah, the big studios and producers, and then you get into the 70s, 60s, 70s, and it's like American new wave and French new wave, and then like, auteurs kind of uh, come in, and like, we're kind of back into this, and then the 80s and 90s, 
saw them doing some crazy, like it was a mixture of auteurs and blockbusters and studios. And now we're kind of in that studio realm world. But I think the artists, you know, will take back when everything everywhere all at once won best picture. I was so happy because I was like, it kind of, I was like, this is awesome. Like, these are like, this is a like creative vision that like speaks to everybody and it's uh, personal too, but yeah, for sure. So yeah, for uh, for Kevin, for you, what, what's there some good things that are happening in the industry for you? For, and you can speak from, you know, it's perspective of music as well, so. Sure, I mean, well, I'm just, even just talking about the show, Frank Elda, I'm really happy that it's finally available in the US after being yes. out in Latin America for a couple of years. And I think at least that speaks of, you know, uh, uh, kind of the, the the studio and the networks being like, all right, this feels kind of offbeat and different and weird, but like, that's cool. Let's see how it does. You know, like yeah. this kind of like vote of confidence of like putting things out there that are a little different and a little offbeat and a little cool and quirky. And I think that's that's cool and that's a good sign. Um, I mean, I think I think the feature film uh, realm is is tricky to navigate, especially sure. with big studios. Uh, but I think. You know, there's there's so many incredible voices from like showrunners doing incredible like television, and I think that might be a space because of all the streamers and because of like the amount of, I mean I hate the word content, but like the amount of uh, uh, yeah. stuff that they need to produce yeah. every year. Um, hopefully that allows people to like tell different and cool and different stories you know yeah i know i know streaming you know is is seen as the enemy and seen as the villain and it and in many ways there's so many problems with streaming and, and what it's caused but it also has allowed so many voices to go on platforms that normally would never get exhibition and it's like you know to to have all these different ver you know show uh, series that and in movies too you know and i'm hopeful that especially stop motion I, i'm happy that your show you know is is doing you know well and i'm happy that you know guillermo del toro did you know pinocchio and and that one best animated feature and i just saw chicken run two and it's it's amazing it's gorgeous and sam fell brought the actual he's like yeah we had some visual effects and stuff to clean things up but it was everything is it felt handmade everything was handmade and you know they still were using clay you know and you were talking about how when they made the original chicken run they were so you know worried about like the thumb we had to smooth out the the, the clay and everything and all that to, it was too too but now they're like it's okay to be a little rough it's okay to to feel the textures and see kind of or what you know Wes Anderson is doing with uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox and Isle of Dogs like so stop motion is uh, hopefully more of that we did an Adventure Time episode in stop motion I thought that was super cool bad jubies and and yeah, so yeah. and I'm so glad that you guys are keeping that art form going and and uh, congratulations on all of it. And thank you so much for for chatting tonight. It was such a pleasure to meet you and to to talk, talk about your collaboration. And it was so great to get an insight from filmmakers and the composer. So yeah, guys, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. It was great to speak about these subjects.